Hello, my name is Zeynep. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Cortex. Uh, welcome to this special session where we will spend some time talking about the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Our goal today will be to dissect the results of the most recent MITRE ATT&CK evaluation results and give you the tools you need to understand the key scoring criteria and interpret the results for your own organization. To do that, I have two guests and cybersecurity experts joining me in the studio. First up is Josh Zalonis, who is the Principal Analyst at Forrester. Thank you so much for joining us, Josh. Happy to be here. And Peter Havens, Director of Product Management at Palo Alto Networks. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Thanks, Dana. Great. Okay, so let's get started with the basics. We all interact with security operations analysts and SOC leaders across the world for various reasons. And I think there's general alignment that we had a lack of independent testing or evaluation historically. Um, Josh, can you give us a sense of how MITRE addresses this challenge? So it's interesting that the MITRE ATT&CK evaluation, it, it solves a really important problem in that we have never had an open methodology for a technical testing and evaluation of these endpoint detection and response products in mm -hmm. the past. And as a Forrester analyst, one of the things that I look to it as an opportunity to make my waves better. Mm -hmm. You know, as an analyst, I do Forrester waves, and one of them that I do is endpoint detection and response. Mm -hmm. So by going and being able to leverage this type of testing that's been done with an open methodology, it allows me to add to the depth of the evaluation that I'm able to do. And similarly, any other organization having access to these test results can do the same when they're making their purchasing decisions. Um, so how did MITRE come about? What is the origin of the test? Initially, uh, the U.S. government paid for MITRE to go and do a closed evaluation of a series of vendors in order to go and uh, figure out who they should be using. Mm -hmm. And as those results were published over time, an interesting thing happened that MITRE is respected as a research organization and largely, well, unbiased and not really tainted by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was you had a number of vendors looked at this evaluation as an opportunity for a not pay-to-play type of technical evaluation like you would get from some other types of testing houses. Okay. And so this led to a lot of interest from vendors and MITRE actually then in turn decided to go and open this evaluation and that's how we came up with this first round of evaluations. I see, okay. Peter, let me ask you, um, we've, uh, you know, MITRE completed round one of testing, which a lot of vendors participated in. Could you give us a sense of what was tested in round one? Yeah, I, I think, um, as Josh pointed out, it, it, uh, the MITRE tests are a bit different. They're modeled after threat groups, in this case, APT3, which mm -hmm. was the, uh, attributed to a China-based uh, threat group, uh, Chinese Ministry of State Security, I believe. Um, so really, it's testing about 25% of the entire attack framework across the different um, techniques or tactics, if you will, across the entire kill chain. And it's done as kind of a, you know, a live red team uh, test against the product. So very different from a lot of the other tests where we're just tossing a product, product over, the, over the board and, and seeing numbers as a result. In this case, you're actually seeing how the, product, um, how the product responded and what detections it could bring to bear against the different tactics that were used in that, in that scope. What percentage of the attack framework does round one cover? Yeah, it covered about 25%, I think, of the overall. Uh, there's about 200 plus, um, I think, techniques in it, the entire mm -hmm. framework. So techniques are constantly being added. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But I, I feel that this is a dangerous question to mm -hmm. ask because we're also getting into one of the issues with the MITRE attack framework itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that people take a look at ability to detect a particular way of performing a technique mm -hmm. and think that it's a checkbox that they can mark off like mm -hmm. a bingo card and say, yeah, we got that one. The reality is, is that there's lots of different ways that an adversary may leverage a technique. And so it's important to understand that your ability to detect an instance of a technique is not representative of your ability to detect that technique, period. Got it, got it, okay. 
Um, it's actually a good follow-on question to that is, um, you know, a lot of vendors think um, or, or, or publish the fact that they did really well on MITRE or, or won it. Uh, is there a winner uh, in, in the MITRE attack evaluations? No, there's not. And let me explain why. Mm -hmm. You see, the MITRE attack evaluation, it wasn't an apples to apples comparison. In fact, as far as an evaluation goes, there wasn't any kind of ranking of vendors released by MITRE. Mm -hmm. Their intention, in fact, was to specifically not do so. Mm -hmm. What they're trying to do is provide scientific data points that are going to allow you to look at how different vendors performed mm -hmm. and evaluate and rank yourself. Got it. And um, maybe it would make it clear for our audience if we take Palo Alto Networks and, um, and you know, you actually developed your own scoring system. Um, and actually, before I go on to Palo Alto, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your scoring system um, and why you, what, what drove you to build it on to, to analyze and interpret the MITRE, MITRE results? So the, the results of the attack evaluation were published as scientific data. Mm -hmm. It's just a data set. Uh, it's inputs and observations about how the product performed. Mm -hmm. Now, when I, have, when I first looked at this data, I thought to myself, you know, this would be fantastic to be able to leverage in a Forrester wave. And so my first shot at evaluating or, or ranking how the vendors performed was to actually go and score it much like I would have done in a wave, looking at how uh, for each particular test that was performed, how the detection happened, and then ranking that. And I actually published a you know, published source code for this uh, without publishing the results because I was trying to also not say that there was a clear winner, but of course I should have known better because publishing source code uh, yeah. for an evaluation like that led immediately to multiple vendors going and publishing that their results based on Josh Salonis's Forrester mm -hmm. uh, you know, public So there was, there was a lot of traction on your scoring system. It, well, let, yeah. let's, let's just say that it got, yeah. it got some attention. Yeah. And what was interesting is that then there was, ended up being a series of blog posts where different vendors were highlighting different other areas or different other ways that mm -hmm. you could evaluate the vendors. Mm -hmm. And you know, frankly, I spent a lot of time going through the results trying to reverse engineer what a lot of these metrics were and how they were being developed. And I started publishing source code so that people could see how those scores were being generated themselves. Mm -hmm. And as I started digging in, I ended up developing three different independent metrics in order to really understand how the vendors performed. And so these metrics were coverage, mm -hmm. correlation, and then kind of an overview of how they performed across the kill chain. Mm -hmm. Now, of these three metrics, two of them are, are quantitative. There's the coverage score. And what that evaluates is the product able to observe that this behavior is occurring? You don't need to alert on it, and you don't need to attribute it to any type of behavior. You just have to be gathering the telemetry for that event. And the idea here is that a team of SOC analysts would be able to hunt against the data set. And so even if the product isn't able to alert on the particular event, mm -hmm. the data exists for a forensic investigation or a threat hunt in order to surface it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, the next metric that I used was built off of that co uh, coverage score. And this is a correlation metric because there was a very important qualifier uh, called tainted in the evaluation. If you observe an event mm -hmm. and then you observe another event, and you're able to show that those two events are related, then you would get the, the tainted mm -hmm. qualifier yeah. on your score. So while there were detections, then there may have also been, well, there were also delayed detections, which means that you didn't just generate an alert. It 
it took some time to mm -hmm. generate that alert. So delayed was another one of the qualifiers. But uh, the interesting thing from my perspective was tainted mm -hmm. and your ability to correlate events. Because when you look at the individual MITRE techniques, mm -hmm. really nothing that's being highlighted is malicious in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you, you don't want a process to go and be reading from the LSAS process. Uh, Mimi Katz is an example. Mm -hmm. So that's something that you would probably indict uh, one way or another. But a lot of other techniques require correlation across, you know, to show a sequence of events that is indicative of bad. And so the correlation score is one that I mm -hmm. used to show that you know, based on the coverage, how well were you able to tie mm -hmm. the individual events together? So I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from multiple different sources, both vendors as well as end users who have started using these metrics. How have you leveraged them? Oh, the, the, uh, the scoring was fantastic for us. Um, you know, as you know, I think that this, there were 136 tactics uh, or techniques, I guess I should say, for, for this round of testing and multiple detections at each step of, of each one of those uh, techniques. So it's a lot of data. If you look through uh, the MITRE evaluations, you can step through and look at this table visually and see the screenshots and all this, and you can actually get to this detailed dump of JSON. And when we got the results back, it's, it's kind of a daunting task to actually go through that and figure out how did you do, and then thinking about, well, how did we do versus how did everybody else do? And we started looking at, at your scoring system, and it, it was just gold for us to, to to be able to look in and, you know, it's all data driven um, and you're diving right in and, and actually pulling out for each of the vendors um, how you did. So right away we could start to see, you know, independent you know independent of our own influence and how we thought we did. How did you think we did? How did we do independently compared to other vendors? So we leveraged it heavily. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, it gave us a really nice kind of spreadsheet of how our coverage was. I had uh, just one question for you though. One of the, the uh, things that coverage spit out the particular script was um, a, a particular field called enrichment Enrichments and delays. I don't know if you wanted to talk about why you chose to uh, couple those together or... Of course. Uh, yeah. So as I was talking about earlier, I was trying to map this initially to the Forrester wave. Mm -hmm. And in the Forrester waves, we have our criteria is measured on a, essentially a 1, 3, and 5 scale. Right. So whenever I was objectively approaching this data, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to feel out kind of what's good, what's better, what's best. Right. So the best we can probably agree is an immediate specific alert about some type of behavior that happened. That's it, mean that it's alert worthy. Right, something bad happened, the light turned on, all right, right. everything's working. Yep. So then what I had to look at from there is, well, what would be a one? And so I said a zero mm -hmm. should be a, a miss, we didn't detect anything. Right. Yep. So one would be the information or the data is there so that an analyst can go and look at it. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the enrichment piece fell in as a three. Right. Now, how I factored in delayed detections mm -hmm. and grouped that in with, uh, with enrichment is I looked at it as being objectively not quite as good as something that would get a five. Mm -hmm. Something happened, light turned on, that's a five. Right. Something happened, a few hours later you get a phone call, it's right. good, but I don't think it's a five. And so then that's why I ended up going and putting it in that three category with enrichment. That makes sense. And just for the audience, enrichment is really just um, some telemetry where you were able to capture that's actually relating to a particular technique or tactic that was used rather than just raw data. The, the so. way that, exactly, the way that I like to describe it to people is that enrichment means that not only did you observe that something happened on the system, but you're able to interpret it. Mm -hmm. Interpret yeah. what that tactic was. Exactly. Yep. Now, an alert would be an indictment, and mm -hmm. so then that's the next tier. So, right. you know, observe, interpret, right. and alert. Yeah. I, th I thought the results were interesting. I thought from our perspective, just going through that, we actually didn't have any delayed results. So. Um, you know, it was just raw product response uh, in our case, so, yeah. 
And then you, you talked about a qualitative one about the kill chain as well. Yes. Yes, the, the qualitative score on the kill chain mm -hmm. is a, essentially it, it's a visibility chart for how well you're able to see what the adversary is doing across different stages of the kill chain. I see. Now, again, it's less important, well, I don't want to say less important per se, mm -hmm. but the idea here is that as an adversary moves through uh, the kill chain, that you would be able to surface that somebody is doing something bad in mm -hmm. your environment mm -hmm. and it falls into this category of behavior. Mm -hmm. The idea being that I don't need you to alert on everything. In mm -hmm. fact, I probably don't want you to alert on everything. Mm -hmm. In the end, what I really want is you to alert on specific behaviors, correlate and give me all the data so and then I can go and yeah. figure out that something bad yeah is happening. Got it, got it. For the sake of um, mm -hmm. sort of going through a, a practical uh, example, um, could you tell us how Palo Alto Networks did, uh, how, how the results for Palo Alto Networks panned out? So in, in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. one of the interesting data points that I found was coverage. Mm -hmm. And the majority of vendors fell right in the mid-70s mm -hmm. for the number of tests that were performed and the amount of telemetry that was gathered. Mm -hmm. Palo Alto Networks came in with an 88, which was 10 percentage points higher than anybody else in mm -hmm. the evaluation. Interesting. Peter, Josh mentioned 88% uh, coverage right. for Palo Alto Networks. What does that exactly mean? Yeah, coverage is one way to look at it. I think uh, kind of an interesting different angle to look at it is, you know, what didn't you cover? What did you, what did you effectively miss? And I think you tease that out in, in your coverage script as well. Uh, and, you know, it's the antithesis of coverage, but for us it was, it was kind of exciting to see that, you know, of that 136 tactics or, or, or the techniques that were used, we only had 15 misses. And, you know, misses don't sound good, but um, those, those particular tactics, if you look at those 136 techniques, are spread across different um, scenarios. And there wasn't any particular um, technique where we, or, or attack vector where we missed everything. We didn't have any gaps, if you will, but we might have missed, a, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, an initial discovery here or something to that effect. But uh, 15 misses is roughly half of any other vendor in the first round. I think the next one was 29. So what that means, again, is just that we have a, a lot of data. We're able to bring a very rich data set of what's happening on the endpoint uh, compared to other vendors that went through it. Okay. Maybe you can jump in and tell us why you think, like, what's in the product that actually helped Palo Alto Networks um, achieve this performance? Yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I think it really just comes down to a kind of a, a maniacal focus on um, data and, and getting data at all levels of the endpoint, right? So we've spent quite a bit of time uh, working on the product and getting ready for the GA that happened in March right before the evaluation and collecting as much information as we can about what's happening on the endpoint. And mm -hmm. with all of that information, all of that data, you can construct and, and piece together the patterns and behaviors that represent you know, the, the attack vectors. Without that data, you, you can't construct anything. And, and I think um, you know, correlations is a great choice of words rather than tainted. I think that's where MITRE is going to go in round two, is describing when you're correlating data between one point and another, as it's, it's correlation that's uh, the term they're going to use. But without the data points, happening in the registry, happening at the file level, process injection, you know, you name it, you can't really bring that all together. So I think where we did really well is just kind of, you know, having drivers at all different levels of the operating system and, and collecting all that telemetry information about what happened. And, and just to set the record straight, obviously um, Cortex-XDR um, is uh, a product that collects data and telemetry from firewall, mm -hmm. um, cloud, and endpoint. Um, Within this testing framework, uh, was firewall data involved? That's a great question. I've, I've had that question quite a number of times. Mm -hmm. People asking if maybe our 10% uplift from the other vendors, because a, a bunch of folks, as you said, were kind of in the mid-70s, uh, came from the firewall. Uh, I wish I could say that we got to bring the firewall to this test. Unfortunately, we did not. All of this just came from our, our XDR endpoint okay, sensors. Okay, so the endpoint data was was Yeah, all endpoints. Okay. Uh, in the future, we might look to bring in mm -hmm. a firewall for additional telemetry coming from mm -hmm. the overall network as well. So. Mm -hmm. so it, is this, is this sufficient um, for security analysts to make their decisions? Is there room for in improvement in the, in the MITRE uh, framework as well? There is. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen was some kind of way of measuring false positives. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've 
kind of figure it out would have been helpful would have been to have a confidence rating or the severity score mm -hmm. that's provided with each of the alerts. Okay. The majority of vendors, when they alert, they give you that severity or, or that confidence, and it might not be quite big picture. And so if you have a, a product that alerts on something like a system doing a, a ARP lookup, mm -hmm. that's something that happens all the time. So are you going to alert on it? Well, in this evaluation, you largely would have gotten credit and been viewed positively for generating an alert on it. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly not something that anybody in Masoc wants you doing. Okay. And so by having the, by having the confidence or, or, or the severity score, you would be able to discount a number of the, uh, a number of the alerts and so you'd be able to get a better picture of what you would be actually getting in your sock. But to take it a step farther, you'd also be able to understand what the persuasion is mm -hmm. towards false positives. You see, when you do an evaluation like this, and you only go and perform fixed inputs and then see what comes out on the other side, you're you're setting up a scenario that favors a false positive prone solution. I see. Because it's going to light up on anything that it ever sees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the, end the end result is alert fatigue at the sock and not mm -hmm. knowing where to really focus your attention. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's yep. interesting. Uh, Peter, very quickly, what's round two about, just so the audience is um, aware? Yeah, round two is uh, it's about APT 29, I believe, Russian mm -hmm. state sponsored, Russian mm -hmm. government uh, kind of going through some of the um, hacks that happened back in the election back in 2016, I think, and looking at those mm -hmm. tactics and techniques. I think the uh, terms for APT29 are mm -hmm. the Dukes, Cozy Dukes, uh, Cozy Bear, some of the other uh, names mm -hmm. that they go by. Um, and there's some modifications to the way detections work. We, we won't see, um, I think, tainted anymore. We'll see correlated. And I think, let's see, what other changes do we have? There will be uh, additional changes. I think they're going to focus more on, I think we have the delayed um, modifier. And I think now this is going to be called MSSP. Uh, or MDR, something like that. Uh, it'll be a type of detection rather than a modifier. And really that's about whether or not the product was able to tease out that mm -hmm. detection directly or whether or not it came from like post-processing an organization or a, a, a body of people that was going through the alerts and then later, maybe hours or days later, sending an email uh, to, to show those results. Right. So yeah. we're starting to see some, I think, I think the MITRE team looking at the way things went the first time and looking to see how they can improve it. Um, it looks right. like it's headed in the right direction. Yeah, and there's a big difference between sort of um, managed services versus the product uh, sort of providing all the, all the uplift. Would you agree? To an extent. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the vendors actually package in mm -hmm. the threat hunting mm -hmm. or the managed service aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a human looking at things as part of what your base product is, it seems only fair to evaluate the product with mm -hmm. that capability, mm -hmm. especially if, let's say, 90% plus of your customers are leveraging that capability. Okay. Now, the differentiation, I think, is, is excellent. It, it, it's important because what we had was delayed, and you know, some of the vendors had <clears throat> technology delays. So mm -hmm. the way that they were doing the data on the back end was generating alerts at a later point. And then some of the other vendors were leveraging their MSSP in order to go and uh, generate the alerts. Both were qualified as delayed in right. the past. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Let me um, ask a, a more general question. Um, obviously, at Palo Alto Networks, we actually have a very specific point of view on what the future of detection and response will be. And that's why we've come up with a product called XDR versus EDR, right? Um, and there's been a lot going on in the industry recently, a lot of acquisitions, a lot of restructuring, consolidation. Um, what is your view on the future of detection and response? Is it endpoint detection and response or cross-data, cross-platform detection and response? Well, there, there's a couple different things happening mm -hmm. right now. One of the conversations that I've been having is actually, should we even be calling this endpoint detection and response anymore? Mm -hmm. And the reason this is a question is because traditionally endpoints are your laptops and workstations, whereas 
majority of organizations are deploying EDR across their server environments as well. So endpoint is not really an effective way of describing how it's being used. Uh, enterprise maybe, enterprise mm -hmm. detection and response mm -hmm. is one of the terms that I've heard getting thrown around. Mm -hmm. Now, to take it, to take EDR to its next level, like, what does it really do and where does it belong in the, the application stack? Uh, you need to think about what the architecture of an EDR product is. First, you have a, an agent that runs on your endpoint or server, and then it's collecting security-relevant data and sending that as telemetry up to, in many cases, the cloud. Now, what the, what's happening in the cloud, I've often referred to as being the mini fridge of SIM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't handle a ton of log types, it handles one. But what's interesting is because the EDR vendors know what type of data they're going to be getting, they're forced to compete on detection which is really, in essence, what we're looking at mm -hmm. from, an EDR or from the MITRE attack evaluation. So when, when we look at what the future of EDR is, I actually look at it as becoming part of the SIM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. And to an extent, that's what you're doing with XDR. Yeah, and whether it's endpoint or enterprise, I think endpoint or service and endpoints are just part of the picture, right? We have to look at the ecosystem as a whole and pulling information from our uh, our cloud resources, mm -hmm. our firewalls, our network services as well. So as much data as we can get in and start correlating is, uh, is a big part of that. You can't deploy EDR on most IoT devices. Right. That's correct because they're not managed. Yeah. Well, oh. and, and okay. then even 10 to 20 percent of your mm -hmm. infrastructure, mm -hmm. the, the actual endpoints themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are not under management a lot right. of the time. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So how do you do detection on a device that you don't have an EDR agent on? Mm -hmm. And this is why EDR in and of itself is not a good enough solution. Mm -hmm. It's a great solution, but it is not the only solution that you need to be using. Mm -hmm. And so by bringing together data from multiple different sources to be able to go and detect <clears throat> anomalies, if you will, in any of these environments mm -hmm. is really to your advantage. Yeah, XDR seems to be catching on as a name potentially too in the market as well. Yes. Uh, we've recently seen. So. We've, we're welcoming <laughs> all the new entrants into the, into the category for sure. Um, last question uh, from me. Um, if we were to leave the audience with one takeaway from this session, um, what is the one factor that they should really be looking into when they are making their investment decisions on detection and response products? Well, number one for me is that any product that is in the market and not getting evaluated by the MITRE attack evaluation, mm -hmm. it, it needs to be viewed with suspicion. Mm -hmm. Got it. We have an open methodology that you know, we've had I believe 13 vendors completed the first round of evaluation and there's 21 vendors going to be going through the second round of evaluations. Yeah, big big increase. I think it might have been 11, I'm not right, sure, but yeah. it's it's a big increase from round one to round two. So mm -hmm. I think that validates the mm -hmm. the approach, uh, the, the difference that, that MITRE brings to the table in terms of the type of um, test this is. So. And, and, and if you're trying to shortlist vendors, mm -hmm. 21 is a pretty big short list. 21 is a very big short list. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is, right. Well, Josh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very helpful for a lot of people who have been watching, I'm sure. And uh, for everyone who's watching, we hope you found this conversation helpful. And we encourage you to dig in and download Josh's scoring system uh, to, make it, uh, to make your own decisions uh, for the future. Until next time, goodbye.